Hi everyone, we're here today with Andre Abadi, who is the Managing Director of JP Morgan's Center for Carbon Transition. Um, this has a global mandate to provide clients in the corporate and investment bank, uh, corporate investment bank and commercial banking with access to sustainability focused finance, research and advisory solutions. Andre was head of the, was the global head of environmental and social risk management at JP Morgan in London for 10 years and was previously the director at Sustainable Finance Limited. Prior to that, he was the head of sustainable business advisory within ABN AMRO's risk management division in Amsterdam, with where he co-authored the Equator Principles and led in, in implementation efforts. He's also chaired the Hydropower Sustainability Assessment Forum, a multi-stakeholder initiative of the International Hydropower Association, which proposed revisions to the in industry's sustainability protocol. Andre holds a master's degree in business administration and an advanced dis diploma in sustainability. So we're very grateful to have him with us today. Thank you very much. Great, thank you for the introduction. Um, just so I'm clear, is someone going to be clicking through the slides? Should I just indicate to whoever that is? Uh, yes, we, we can click, click through the slides if you can't on your end. I uh, don't think I can. So um, okay. first of all, good evening to all. Sorry, I couldn't be there in person. I guess we had a few uh, issues with the trains today, but um, hopefully at a, a later event, more than happy to come back. So just to give you um, a very high level snapshot, I'm assuming that many of you in the room um, or on, on the call will be somewhat familiar with the topic, but I thought I'd just give you a bit of a rundown as to how banks have been approaching not only climate, but broader ESG environmental social issues for certainly the two plus decades that I've been active in, in the sector. And I thought a good place to start, um, as you go to the next slide, is, is actually just considering the, the concept of single or double materiality. Uh, if someone can advance this slide, I'm not sure who has it. There we go, thank you. So this is a, uh, a topic, again, I'm, I expect that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, I thought it was an interesting place to start because Interestingly, the, the concept as it's being discussed right now is that when you think about financial materiality, historically, uh, the way in which that's been looked at is, of course, the impact on a company's business. And that's been, let's call it the single materiality. But when I look at it from the perspective of how banks looking at environmental, social, ESG risk or climate risk have considered it, um, Certainly from an environmental social point of view, you think more about the impact that a client's operations have on the environment. And so that's where the double materiality lens come in, comes in. So, so the point in essence is that what we have now in, in many ways is a meeting of, of these two worlds, where from a, a financial analysis perspective, historically broader climate ESG factors, um, we're, we're purely focused on the impacts to a company's business and didn't consider the impact on the environment or society, whereas from an environmental social risk perspective, that was predominantly what we focused on. We wanted to make sure that if we were doing any business with a client in a sector that had an environmental social impact, that was our focus. So, so the blending together of these concepts, I think is, is a very interesting step. Certainly it's a topic that the European Union is embracing and, and considering in, in a whole range of certainly its financial uh, regulatory architecture and certainly disclosure as well. Our expectations are that, that you're going to see considerations of, of double materiality in, in a number of, of disclosure expectations. Whereas in the US and other places, you've got the Securities Exchange Commission considering whether it should just be single or double materiality. So this, this debate is an interesting one to, to look at at the moment. And I think the, the core of it is important because when you think more broadly about ENS risk, ESG, uh, again, it's it's focused more on the financial impact to a company, but I think the, the key point going forward is that we, we need to integrate considerations of, of how a company's operations have that reverse impact. And climate change in, in particular, and climate risk is actually pretty unique when it comes to environmental or social risk topics or ESG topics, because certainly in, in my experience, it's the first time that you've actually seen an environmental or social topic, certainly an, an environmental topic, being one that financial regulators consider a financial risk. Historically, a lot of environmental social issues have been more reputation risk. So yes, there, there, there may be an environmental impact and it may in certain 
instances cause financial risk or financial impact, but it's not as systemic or widespread as considerations around um, climate risk could be. And, and in fact, some of you may be familiar, I think it was more than a decade ago, the, just after the last financial crisis, the, the thesis started being discussed around um, unburnable carbon, carbon bubble, stranded assets. Are we in a situation where the next financial crisis could actually be one around climate or carbon? And the thesis is one that Mark Carney, former governor of the Bank of England, certainly bought into. Yeah, his thesis was indeed the, fin the next financial crisis could be the fact that the financial, financial sector is overexposed to fossil fuel assets or carbon intensive assets. And from a financial regulatory perspective, it's, it's a topic that uh, certainly the regulators need to start focusing on. I'll come back to that later on because th that is certainly one of the drivers that we're seeing increasingly in, in the work that we're doing. So just a high level introduction to, to the concept. If you go to the next slide, um, how this has played out in, I think it was back in 1997, the Economist Intelligence Unit came up with this term, the death of distance. Now, it was more about the shrinking of the world because of um, yeah, social media, access to, to information more readily, and of course, these are just two, two graphics that, that I've often used in, in training slides in the past, that you basically historically would, would have a situation where there could be environmental and or social impact in, in far-flung reaches of, uh, of the planet, but unless you were actually aware of what those impacts were, they often went unnoticed. But certainly what we found in the banking sector around right about the turn of, of the millennium was that we suddenly started seeing a lot of criticism leveled at the banks because we were not taking into consideration environmental social impacts in the lending certainly we were doing. I remember doing project and export finance in South Africa um, in the last millennium when I was a banker and I do remember that the diligence we did when it came to environmental social issues was very very little or very very sparse and so what you what you had was this rude awakening if you will um, of a lot of critics civil society non-governmental organizations challenging the fact that banks needed to be smarter and take into account the environmental social impacts of, of the clients that they were financing. So this death of distance certainly brought home to, to us in the banking sector the fact that this was a topic we needed to look into. If you go to the next slide, in essence, what this has resulted in, and again, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this, is you've moved from a, a historical situation where largely the most important stakeholders, certainly if you were a listed company, were your shareholders and, and you know, your regulators, but over time, the fact that you had information that was more accessible, you had criticism from civil societies, not, not equally in all countries or geographies, um, certainly in, in, in parts of the world, it's, it's, um, you know, there isn't as much freedom of press, of, of course, or freedom of movement. Um, and so sharing of information is, is not as widespread, but certainly as global banks, we recognize that you could be criticized for not taking into consideration environmental and social consequences of, of the financing you're providing. And interesting now, historically you may have seen, I, I remember when I first started in the space, um, you know, sustainability was more about you know, triple bottom line or, or making sure you were looking after resources that, that future generations would need. It is interesting now, you, you look at the ISSB, who, who as some of you may know, is now coming out with the reporting guidelines and standards for how companies should be disclosing environmental, social uh, and governance uh, considerations in their financial reporting. This concept now over a, a business ecosystem, which I think is, is actually an important one, because it does take into consideration this, this broader multi-stakeholder model. So going on to the next slide, um, you can see I've lifted this from uh, SIB, SIA partners. It's, it's actually quite interesting to at some of their work. This basically frames, coming back now to, to the, the climate risk or climate change consideration from the banking sector, this very nicely frames certainly the challenges and, and I would say opportunities that, that we have. Um, what is going on right now across the banking sector certainly, and, and this is, is replicated more broadly in the financial sector, is that we are being asked the question whether or not we understand how climate risks manifest in our decision making, how they may manifest when it comes to the, the risks that we have on our balance sheet. Are we taking into consideration these risks as, as we're pricing loans, as we're deciding which clients to, to do business with? And a lot of this is driven again by financial regulators, central banks, um, who are starting to, to expect that we demonstrate 
that we're stressing our balance sheets. So do we have significant lending exposure to clients that are in sectors where there may be transition risk? Where if you assume a certain carbon price or assume that in, in a decade or more, the demand for a, a client's product may not be there anymore. So is that going to tr translate into a financial risk for our clients? And so these concepts of both transition risk, so is my is my business, is my balance sheet, is my client able to transition and manage their business over a period of, of time to take into consideration these emerging trends, things like carbon price, things like new technologies that are being developed? Um, and is there a physical risk? So if I'm a big mortgage lender or I have a, a large commercial real estate portfolio, uh, are there consequences again to my balance sheet if I have overexposure to, to certain geographies or jurisdictions where these risks may be quite significant? And so the expectation from regulators and now also from some of our investors and shareholders is that we demonstrate as banks that we're taking these considerations into account, which certainly is fair game. I think the challenge that, that we're certainly seeing in a lot of these conversations is uh, there's an overemphasis on the role of the financial sector when it comes to these topics, and that's something we can maybe address in the Q&A. That yes, we do have visibility over, over the, the actions of our clients. Um, we certainly do have you know, decision-making responsibility and, and uh, ability when it comes to who it is we do business with and what type of financing. But if we think of some of the 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 triggers that are necessary in order to get the, the global economy to tr start transitioning towards a net zero future in 2050, that's not going to come from, from, from banks making more informed decisions. That's going to come from regulators, governments setting the policy framework, like you've seen in the US with the Inflation Reduction Act, to actually enable the transition to happen. And then the capital that we provide and others provide will absolutely flow into those solutions. But there's, there's this dynamic which is still being fleshed out and, and debated as to so how much is, is it our responsibility to demonstrate that we're the ones that are allocating capital to these solutions. Because truth be told, as we're going through exercises right now, looking at the materiality of climate risk to our balance sheets, given that most banks will look three to five years into the future, because that's a typical credit cycle, you're not actually seeing that, that uh, Certainly, transition risk is translating into material financial risk just yet. So that's that's certainly a, a topic which certainly we're all focused on, and, and regulators increasingly are focusing on. I think just a few other things. I'm not going to go through the whole slide, but but all of these considerations are absolutely in play when it comes to how it is we're, we're approaching the topic. You know, as as a bank, we're one of the certainly, depending on how you count it, we're one of the world's largest financial institutions. Um, we do have exposure to a lot of clients that are in carbon intensive sectors, but it is also those clients in those sectors which will likely have the winners of tomorrow as they change their business models or as they provide some of the solutions that are needed when it comes to net zero. So making sure you're selecting the right clients, making sure you're analyzing clients in a way which gives you the information that you can make more informed decisions. So this is the data challenge on the bottom right hand side understanding the, the true nature of the, the climate related risk drivers both transition and physical um, understanding the the regulatory perspectives not only how for instance central banks are going to be looking at us and expecting us to to uh, manage these issues but looking at for instance the securities exchange commission the stock exchanges what what are the reporting requirements um, reputation risk i've already touched on a little bit uh, earlier is absolutely a topic we're familiar with and, and cognizant of. And that also comes into play when you consider greenwashing. Now, greenwashing can be debated, and we can come back to this in the Q&A as well. Greenwashing is an interesting one because it, it manifests in, in several ways. And, and in essence, what it means is you're, you're either overselling or overpromising that you're doing something that is, is green when in actual fact it isn't. Now, there could be a legal risk if you're, um, in essence, stating or taking a position and investors are, are buying into that and the actual reality is you're not actually having an impact that is as green as you're, as you're making out. For us as the banking sector, if we're underwriting debt or we're taking, we're lending money to a client who has certain KPIs or use of proceeds where, where they're purporting to be greener than they have historically, there are ways in which you can assess if that's actually true or not. And unfortunately, a lot of what we're seeing in the market is is being challenged because it isn't truly green enough. And, and I think there's, 
part of this dynamic is interesting because it's it's part of the pressure that I've seen banks feel that they need to demonstrate that they're taking this into account. And so they want to show that the green side of the balance sheet is growing significantly. And a lot of our clients in sectors that are being challenged as well are feeling that they need to demonstrate they're actually doing something meaningful, both of which I understand and I'm sympathetic to. But just getting the threading the needle and making sure that what you're actually doing and where it is you're actually applying capital is to the right solutions is something that um, needs to be focused on increasing the over, over the next few years. So those are just some of the, the aspects that, that we're dealing with. Um, if you go to the next slide, what does this actually mean in practice? Um, and, and this, truth be told, could cover any environmental social topic, any ESG topic, but specifically to, to climate, if I think of that context. And the way in which we, for instance, have gone about setting targets, thinking about how we, we integrate considerations of climate risk and climate change into our decision making, we decided the best thing to do was look at the parts of our, of our balance sheet or portfolio. Where do we have financial exposure? So who are we lending to? Who are we doing capital markets business with? What sectors? What geographies? And let's set targets that are net zero aligned um, or below two degrees. We, we set three initial targets for the power sector, the automotive sector, and the oil and gas sector. We've just added three sectors um, last a couple of months ago now for steel, cement, and aviation. And in essence, what you do is you look at the world in 2050, you use a scenario which in essence shows you where economic activity should be if we're solving for, for net zero again in 2050, which doesn't mean no, carbon emissions, as you probably know, but it means that if there are emissions, they need to be captured or offset. Um, then if you work your way backwards to your a starting point, 2023, you can determine what the transition pathway needs to be for clients in, or certainly for, for those sectors. And so you set targets. So we have an interim target of 2030 for all of the sectors where our expectation is that the financing we provide to these companies needs to be a certain carbon intensity. So that the, the, so the client's activity basically needs to be a lot less carbon intensive, whether they're selling cars, whether they're generating power, um, whether they're uh, developing a ton of steel or a ton of cement or flying an aircraft. Each of those, you can actually quantify what the carbon intensity of that activity is. We can then figure out how much financing we should be providing to those clients, given that carbon intensity, but also to try and work with them to reduce that carbon intensity over a period of time. Separately, we also this year, because we, we've joined the Net Zero Banking Alliance, which again, some of you may be familiar with, we're going to have to start reporting on the absolute finance emissions. So if you will, the, you know, the carbon footprint of, of all of our financed activities, which is more of a reporting exercise, um, less so than an actual targeting exercise. We can get into the details of that in Q&A if, if you'd like. But basically, when it comes down to how it is on any topic, as I said, this, this applies to any ESG topic, but certainly climate. When we're looking at transactions, we need data from the clients. That means emissions data. We need to understand what their trajectory is, what their strategy is, how they're going to change the business model. That needs to be plugged into our operational processes. So how do we change models? How do we change decision-making uh, structures? Um, changing when the transaction goes to balance sheet committees and, and underwriting committees, what information is necessary? who makes the decisions, so governance considerations. Once you've built up over a period of time enough information at the transactional level plugged into your operations, you start getting data, of course, that's fed out. Um, and you can start making tactical decisions. You can start engaging with clients, understanding about, well, should I reduce exposure to this client or should I not do this transaction or rather should I be financing or, 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 or financing more of, a, of the next transaction because we actually think that's the right type of business to be supporting. And so these are the decisions you start making more tactically, but then you add all of that up. And then strategically, we can start deciding, you know, who are the clients? What are the geographies? What are, what are the type of financial solutions we should be taking to clients? Because what we should be doing is playing a role in actually helping uh, facilitate this transition to a lower carbon future. So what, you, what you're moving from is a more informed decision-making platform um, which most banks are now working on to, to really truly integrate considerations of climate in order to align their portfolios, but also to manage transition risk. So this cuts both ways. And in essence, the, the key is to change the nature of the conversation. And of course, uh, it could be that you come up with different financial structures or different, different means of financing that transition to try and uh, support uh, clients' development. Uh, if you go into the next slide, I'll just conclude with a couple more. Um, 
just to give an example, of course, how and it comes back to this ecosystem point I was making a little bit earlier when you look at what ISSB is articulating as, as what they think the right approach to, to sustainability reporting is going to be on a go-forward basis. Um, how this manifests, and that's more from a reporting perspective, but I, I think it's an important concept because this is a snapshot from the UK's aviation targets. Um, I think the key, you probably can't read the detail, but you know the, the key is that there's an element here, if you look at the orange uh, bar, of taking into consideration changing the type of aircraft that airlines fly. You can now buy, I think it's the 7, uh, 787 MAX, I think it was 737 MAX, and there's an Airbus, um, which are 25% more efficient given the way they've been designed um, than traditional aircraft. But of course, that's not the only solution. We need sustainable aviation fuels, which is actually probably going to be the key element of, of how it is you, you transition. But then if you go to the next slide, uh, and this is actually taken from JP Morgan's own uh, carbon compass methodology in which we've, we've set out our targets and, and our thinking. If you look at, uh, this is taken from the IEA net zero scenario, which is the scenario we've used to set our 2030 interim targets, and actually most banks will use the same scenario. You can see there that if you look at 2030 and 2050, in order for um, fuel consumption in the aviation sector to change, you're going to have to see a lot more um, synthetic fuel, biofuels, so sustainable aviation fuels, and that's actually a significant um, step up. And, and the key, coming back to the ecosystem point, and I'll conclude here, is that so, so when we approach this topic, but I'll broaden it to, to frankly any topic, what you always got to consider is, so we have a relationship with a client in a certain sector, and in, so, in some sectors, so let's take the power sector, that power utility is able to decide to start mothballing or closing down coal-fired power or ramping up renewable energy. So there's ways in which a client can directly control the carbon intensity of, of their activities. And then when we make financial decisions, we understand um, what we should be supporting, um, what geographies are perhaps lagging behind other geographies, depending on a variety of, of factors. But for each of the sectors you look at when you consider climate change, climate risk uh, considerations, you've got to understand contextually and from an ecosystem perspective, what are the levers and what are the opportunities these clients actually have? What is, what is necessary in order for these sectors to transition? And when it comes to the aviation sector, we've, we've done a lot of canvassing of, of the airlines in the last year or so. And we hear consistently the same thing, which is, look, as long as all of you want to con continue to fly you know, twice a year to Ibiza for your holidays or to fly across the Atlantic um, for business trips, we're going to be providing you with the product, which is you know, the, the, uh, the flights. But the, unless we've got Boeing and Airbus who are developing more fuel efficient aircraft, unless we've got General Electric and Rolls-Royce who are producing engines that are more fuel efficient or can actually consume uh, sustainable aviation fuels or potentially even hydrogen. And unless you actually have the production of sustainable aviation fuels, whether that's from bio sources, so uh, you know, waste matter and, and plants and what have you, or whether it's actually synthetic, so hydrogen, for instance, all of that requires an ecosystem approach. So it's not, when we look at a target for the airline sector, it's not going to be the airlines alone that can achieve that. They are beholden to our demand as consumers for those flights, they're reliant on the ability of, of aircraft manufacturers um, to develop and, in, and um, I guess, uh, come up with more fuel, again, fuel efficient aircraft, basically, so to innovate. Um, but there's, as I said, airline, uh, aircraft manufacturers, as well as the engine manufacturers, as well as SAF producers, all of that needs to be in place in order for, for those sectors to transition. So when it comes to, last thing I'll say, when it comes to certain sectors, I mean, a lot of you will, will uh, have seen and heard a lot of focuses on the oil and gas sector um, as the big bad guys that need to transition. But, you know, the reality is as long as there's demand for oil and gas, it's very unlikely the oil and gas sector is going to be able to transition. As long as the downstream sectors are, are continuing to demand oil and gas for whatever their, their, their products are. Um, and so that comes back to to... One of the points I made earlier, when we look at the role we need to play, we absolutely need to be more informed. We need to understand that this is these are true financial risks. Yes, there's reputation risk attached to, to these. So there's this double materiality point, which we're, we're cognizant of and take into consideration. But in order for us to 
to be able to demonstrate that our own decision making is leading to a lower carbon future. Um, it is dependent on regulators, uh, governments, policymakers to actually put in place the preconditions for that to happen. Again, the Inflation Reduction Act and the EU is looking at something similar. So it's it's a very interesting time to, to be in the banking space. Uh, certainly, you know, I, I would say that for those of us who've been in in, in this industry and in climate environmental uh, roles for the last two decades, you know, this is our time in essence because what we've actually seen is is finally a lot of these environmental considerations are actually now being taken into consideration in, in, from a more strategic perspective than purely a reputation perspective. So it is really interesting. I think banks will be the first to say we have a significant role to play and we recognize and understand that. I think, they, as I said, there may be overemphasis on, on how much of a role we can play um, absent the policies that, that need to drive that. Um, but certainly is a, a really interesting time to be in the space. So let me stop there. Um, hopefully that wasn't too quick. I know it was a bit high level, but um, happy to take any questions and have a discussion. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we'll open it up for questions now. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I was asking, you talked a lot about energy consumption, and I was wondering if you could talk a little uh, more specifically about um, the other side, uh, slightly the other side, carbon capture, uh, utilization and storage technology, and uh, how the current outlook is in J.P. Morgan or in banking in general at that, and uh, given the challenges that, that I'm recognizing with the economic viability of this technology, how will the finance ecosystem evolve to support the continued growth of that industry? I think I got most of the questions about carbon capture. Um, look, I think it's, if you look at the IEA net zero scenario, they, um, they basically state that you are not, we are not going to get to net zero unless you accept that carbon capture has to be part of the equation. In fact, I think one of the statistics is that 50% of all um, single site assets that generate carbon. So what, what, I, what they mean by that is so power plants, um, other industrial facilities. So think of you know, aluminum plants, steel, cement. 50% of, of all of these assets globally will need to have carbon capture installed um, in order for us to, to get down to net zero. Because remember, again, net zero, the key word in, in, uh, in, that, in those two words is net. It's not going to be zero, it's going to be net zero, which means carbon capture or some means of capturing that carbon has to come into play. Um, I think the, the challenge, there's probably two or three challenges. One is the obvious financial challenge, which is, um, I'm sure you've seen this, and this is probably part of, of why you're asking the question, that um, it can be very expensive to, to capture the carbon and store it. Um, We've seen demonstration plants where uh, you, you really also need to make sure that the, the carbon stream that is coming off of whatever the activities you're capturing, so if it's coal-fired power, gas-fired power, whatever the, the carbon stream is, it, the purer it is and the more carbon rich it is, the, the better it is because it's less expensive, you're capturing more carbon, basically. Um, but in, in some facilities like steel, uh, my understanding is it's more complex because there's so many different parts of the steel producing um, uh, system that you, you may, it's probably too expensive to actually put carbon capture facilities on each and every single component of that. For, for cement, it is, it's essential. If you look at the, the trajectories that we've defined in the targets for the cement sector, um, I think roughly 60% of the solution for cement to decarbonize is gonna come from carbon capture. So th there is some negativity around it. Um, because there is there is a view that that I wouldn't say is widespread, but we've certainly heard a lot of, of times, which is is that just an excuse or an escape route for oil and gas companies to continue to drill for oil and gas? Because they believe that at some point they'll capture this, so no need for them to transition. I think there may be a, a small element of, of fact in that, but certainly in the conversations we've seen, um, oil and gas companies are not proposing carbon capture because they just want to stay in the business of oil and gas. I think they're proposing it because they recognize that if anyone is going to crack this from a cost perspective, if anyone has the understanding of, of how to work with reservoirs, which is where the carbon needs to be stored, if anyone has an understanding of how pipelines need to be fit in order for the captured carbon to be transported, it is going to be the oil and gas sector. And, we, and we've seen companies like Occidental actually um, seeing that part of their 2050 net zero target is all about carbon capture. 
So what, what happens with the Inflation Reduction Act is going to be an interesting thing to see. You, you've probably seen that the different levels of, of subsidy, if you will, where if you capture the carbon and store it, then you get a certain, um, it's called a rebate or basically a benefit. If you use the carbon, and I'll, I'll come into that in a second, then you don't get as much of a, of a benefit. But using carbon may actually be part of the solution as well, because you could actually use some of the carbon streams in hydrogen production, or you could use carbon capture. Um, if, if you capture the carbon from, um, from gas, for instance, you, you could then develop blue hydrogen. So it's good. It, the next two or three years is an interesting inflection point because we see the need for carbon capture technology to come down in cost and, and to be ramped up significantly and to be supported by governments as well. Because we do agree with the, um, the idea that it's, it has to be part of the, the equation. Um, but is getting that cost down, getting society to accept that it has to be part of the equation and understanding the ways in which that carbon can be, first of all, stored and captured, but also potentially used in different ways. Um, all of that is still uh, up for discussion. Last thing I'll say is we, we haven't seen many financing opportunities. I, I think a lot of our clients are a little bit reticent to try and get these, these projects financed. Again, some of the uncertainty around policy, but I think the Inflation Reduction Act is, is gonna drive more demand for that. Thank you. Hi, Andre. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much for your talk, um, Roberto Spacey. I was just wondering, <clears throat> you've stated and commented on the importance of regulators and government to intervene to, to support yep. a low carbon transition in the financial sector. Um, you've spoken of, about the Inflation Reduction Act. I was wondering, is there any, what kind of legislation and pointers are you anticipating or considering or expecting here in the UK um, that would support this transition? It's a great question, and, and I'm sure you've seen the 300 plus pages of analysis that was done. And I know the, the government is yeah, targeting exactly. end of March, I think it is, to come out with its plans. I think, look, you know, it, it's going to have to be uh, economy wide, sector wide. Um, so, you know, I, I'll be curious to see how much the UK government leans into the whole hydrogen space because I, I do think. Our own view is that hydrogen is probably the crown jewel when it comes to what is truly going to unlock the transition. And of course, what goes with it is, are we talking green hydrogen, which of course comes from renewable energy? Then the big question is, well, how much renewable energy is the UK government going to be able to incentivize? Or are we going to see, you may be familiar with this, Morocco is, is, is being touted as a, um, a destination for significant renewable development and possibly even um, an undersea transmission cable from Morocco around the Iberian Peninsula to the UK in order to provide us with more renewable energy, which could then really kickstart more of a, a green hydrogen economy here. Um, certainly the technology around hydrolysis um, yeah, it exists and we've got water. So, so I think that the hydrogen space, I think, is going to be something we're going to monitor very closely. Carbon capture equally, you know, what we do with some of the North Sea uh, reservoirs, because you, you could certainly see, and we've seen a couple of clients talking about using some of the North Sea assets to um, to store carbon. So that's going to be an interesting uh, space. I think just, just bringing it more local for all of us, you know, I'm sure you all live in houses like I do, which have single glazed windows. And my Greenwich Council doesn't allow me to put a double, you know, double glazing windows in. And when you consider about, you know, the re replacing all of your, um, your, your heaters and, and putting heat pumps in and things like that, you know, it's going to be essential that, that we figure out how to address the housing stock. Because if you think of the real estate sector, and real estate actually is one of the, the sectors we're going to have, have to set net zero targets for in time. But I think the statistic is something like along the lines of, you know, 80% of, of real estate is already here and we have to retrofit and deal with it. 20% is about new build and, you know, can it be built according to, to certain you know, lead certification and, and other requirements, which is fine, but it's not going to address the the housing stock and a lot of the building stock that we have. So how it is that's incentivized, um, you know, how, how, how much is the UK similar to what the US, and I'm sure you've seen some of the criticism of the Inflation Reduction Act, a lot of finger pointing about, you know, the whole made in America requirement and, and protectionism, and um, we should have, you know, more global and open supply chains. But frankly, I think, um, it doesn't surprise me that that's the route that, that certainly the U.S. has taken, and I, I expect the European Union may follow suit. But the question for the U.K. government is, 
how do they incentivize um, a lot of the technology and, and, and I guess some, some of the breakthrough technology that is needed in order to um, you know, accelerate the development of hydrogen, accelerate the development of renewable energy, bring down the cost of carbon capture, um, look at ways in which you can, um, you can really roll out the infrastructure that's needed for, again, the housing stock to be decarbonized. Um, so, so that's what we're going to be looking at is, you know, some of the more local aspects, some of the, some of the incentivization to really develop local industry and some of the supply chain solutions within the country. And of course, you know, the big tickets like green hydrogen, renewable energy, carbon capture. Thank you. Yeah, go for it. Hi, um, my name is Millie. Um, Hi, Millie. I have a question about the exposure of JP Morgan, um, considering the collapse of the Vera carbon credit scheme and what you see going forward in the market uh, in terms of reasonable offsets and whether you think offsets is the way to go rather than actually degrowth, some form of form of financing where we actually stop thinking that growth is going to be endless and live within our resource limits and live within our planetary boundaries and yeah. near this carbon credit market collapse kind of indicates that that's the way we need to go. So I'm just yeah. asking about your your perspective on this and where you see big banks going. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting question, Lily. I think, you know, I'll, I'll probably give you my own personal philosophical view a little bit as well. Um, look, I think I've always struggled a bit with offsets. I mean, I get it. And, and I think for certain sectors like aviation, it's it's probably unavoidable. For the harder to evade sectors, there's only so much these sectors can do to actually totally uh, minimize or extract or, or reduce any greenhouse gas emissions from their activity. And as long as that activity is still important to global society, we just have to accept there will still be certain residual carbon emissions. You, you can't you can't get to a, to a, a neg negative growth in, in certain sectors. And certainly, I think we're going to have to look at ways in which that can be offset. So depending on the sector, I think offsets are unavoidable. I think the key for us is focusing first and foremost on making sure that our clients can make the, the R&D investment choices, the capex spend, the, the decisions to, to first and foremost completely reduce um, emissions from their activities. And then if there's residual emissions, of course, you then start looking at offsets. And of course, the offsets market, I think, is going to be important for that reason, that there are going to be certain sectors who do as much as they can, but they need to go to the market to try and buy their way, if you will, out, out of you know, the rest of it. So I think it's offsets will play a role, but I, 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 I don't want to over uh, overemphasize the importance because i think what we should focus on is getting the right technologies like carbon capture you know like hydrogen which should bring down the overall emissions that needs to be offset i think degrowth negative growth i, mean, I think there are going to be certain sectors if we look back in 100 years that probably won't exist or the scale of them is going to be quite different um I guess, you know, as long as there's 8 billion plus of us on this planet, I, I, I think some form of growth is always going to be inevitable. But I think it is to your question, how do we live within the planetary boundaries? And this comes back also to the hydrogen conversation, because hydrogen, of course, can be converted into ammonia, which can be used as fertilizer, which could increase the productivity of land. So I think that there's a lot, there's a lot of circular economy conversations which need to go into this place. So as long as your circular economy footprint is is negative that doesn't mean you can't have any growth if that makes sense so i i think all of these topics are up for conversation and i think the the key of course is i don't think we've got enough data or information on on you know how this is truly going to work and and i think the more we have the the financial incentivization the policy developments to um to allow for the, the primary solutions, as I'm calling them, so the hydrogen, the, the renewable energy, the carbon capture, as long as we have the support for the primary solutions, I, I think we can figure out a lot of the questions around circular economy, you know, negative growth, um, living within the planetary boundaries at, at a later point in time. I, I, I think those will come uh, hand in glove. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hello. You um, might need to speak up or come closer. Yeah. Do you think like there is any uh, financial interest in managing water currents that instigate climate change? And how do you see this in the future role of hydro energy economy? 
So I missed that managing water in the context of by certain currents like El Nino, La Nina, because as they as climate change impacts increase, there could be interest to you know stop those currents from doing what they do. Are we talking like ge geoengineering, basically? Yes. Yeah. Look, I mean, I I think <laughs> to me, uh, mankind it comes comes back to my own philosophy. Mankind's existence on this planet is one big exercise in geoengineering. Um, I, I I struggle with adding more geoengineering to the solution personally. I, look, I think I can understand cloud seeding and, and but if you if you're what we're talking about is you know reversing uh, or, or trying to really have whole wide scale influence on on weather patterns and climate, I think that's potentially problematic. I, I, as I said, I, I think what I'd rather see is that we really focus on um, what is manageable within. The confines about of how the global economy is run you know reduce the carbon intensity of of, of production reduce the the footprint that we have um the con consumptive footprint that we have so it's we'll see um I, I i do know that there are some scientists out there that do think that there's going to come a point when we realize that net zero 2050 is off the table and we may need some form of geoengineering at that point to to try and start reversing some of the impacts. I certainly hope we, we don't get to that point um, or that we know enough that we can manage it appropriately. But again, it's uh, I, I think that's that's to me a little bit of science fiction in the future. I think right now we're going to have to focus on the industrial complex and how we how do we extract carbon from that. OK. Hi, Andre. <laughs> Roberto again. We've spoken about um, the role of government regulators as well as commercial banks. I was wondering, in, for central banks, what do you see their role in enabling uh, a low carbon transition in finance beyond, I mean, is there a role beyond just stress testing the entire economy? Yeah, yeah it's, you know, I, I think if you went and spoke to the Fed uh, and went and spoke to the European Central Bank, you probably get well, they would say you wouldn't get different answers, but if you actually read what they're saying, you get slightly different answers. I, I think, and it's it's interesting because I'll come back to Mark Carney as well. I mean, ultimately, you know, their role is to try and make sure that that financial stability is is understood and respected. And um, I've heard repeatedly from certainly the Fed and from the Bank of England that it's not their job to set climate policy. And certainly, it's a very inefficient way of, of driving climate policy if they're expecting central banks to require that the banking sector is the one that makes the financial decisions to try and drive climate policy. It just doesn't work that way. So I, I, I do think if what I would say is if we as banks are, are too slow to appreciate the realities of, of the climate transition, if we're, if we're not serious enough about taking into consideration the broader climate impacts, both physical and transition. If we're not demonstrating that we're making more informed decisions, allocating capital responsibly, appropriately, changing strategies where we do need to change that strategy, um, I think it, it will come, there will come a point where we will be retaining a lot of risk on our balance sheets. And it's fair game for a central bank to then say, look, I don't believe that you're doing enough. And I'm concerned that you're overexposed to to climate transition risk. I, I I don't think that time is coming yet. I what we've heard consistently is that all of the central banks are looking to learn from from how it is we're going about this. And frankly, we're all on a bit of a learning curve. But my expectation is that within the next two to three years, we may actually see capital charges where if we have too much exposure to the wrong type of sector or, or operations, it may be that we need to price the risk differently or hold more capital on our balance sheet, which will then incentivize us to to rather finance other activities. So I, I think the role of central banks is, is part and parcel of the overall solutions. It comes back a little bit to my ecosystem point, which is, you know, we're all part of this, uh, but it's figuring out, you know, what are the, what are our swim lanes? So what is it we should be doing? What is it the central bank should be doing? What is it government should be doing? I think there's still a little bit of a blurring of, of where that begins and ends. I think if you just look at the, the transition plan task force, the TPT, which some of you may be familiar with, um, a, a lot of what has been recommended in terms of the disclosure expected of uh, all sectors, not just the financial sector, um, depending on how you look at that, some of it oversteps what 
I would certainly think is is appropriate. You know, asking for us to lobby governments and demonstrate how it is how successful we are at lobbying governments. Like, fine, I'm, we're happy to have a conversation with the government, but is it really on us to lobby to change policies? And so, yeah, you know, it's there, there's certain aspects which are, I I think I think what we're seeing is there's a lot of stakeholders in in this whole um, equation and. I, I still think each person's or each stakeholder's role is still being wrestled over. Um, but yes, the short answer back to your question, central banks are going to be part and parcel of this, but they need to stay in their swim lanes and actually focus on um, you know, the, the sanctity, if you will, of the banking sector and not try and set climate policy. Thank you. Any more questions? If you got nothing well, I mean, I, I have another, and this is, will not be, uh, appreciate it perhaps by the other by the rest of the audience but perhaps somewhat of a per personal question um i'm currently a master's student keen on writing my dissertation with a new space um particularly interested in risk potentially as well as some broader sort of systems thinking methodologies if that means anything to you i guess i just wanted to ask where do you see sort of the do you see any need in any specific areas for more research from academia in that space um perhaps if we're thinking about specific policies or regulation that government can introduce does anything come to mind look it's a broad question i i, okay. I think there's, there's there's always room for for informed thinking on on all of these topics you know i think there's um if I just just I'll give you one example, just to kind of open the kimono a bit within the banking sector. Now, I would certainly consider we're, you know, as I said, we're one of the largest banks and we are full of pretty smart people. But I can tell you, when I sit down with um, a lot of my colleagues, you know, there's a lot of head scratching going on around how is it that you do proper stress tests? How is it that you actually model, um, which is what some of the central banks are asking us. What is your balance sheet going to look like in 2030, 2040, 2050? How, how are you preparing, if you look at the transition plan task force, how are you preparing financially to provision for, for a potential eventuality in 2030 if, it doesn't, uh, if your, your balance sheet doesn't transition? These are tough questions to, to, to be addressing. Um, a lot of it is going to come down to just analyzing a lot of the data we already have um, in terms of you know what is the is there a correlate correlation or causation between certain performance indicators and um and, and financial performance on on companies you know that's still for a lot of sectors very indeterminate and, and it's not entirely clear um so i i think that the whole space is ripe for for deeper study i think we've got i would say that the science you know if you actually look at the climate science and you know there's a lot of monte carlo simulation and what have you going on i think I think that's been very effectively done. I think that the, the translating of these both physical and transition variables into financial variables is, is, is the sweet spot that a lot of financial institutions are struggling with. Like, how can I demonstrate that if there is an increased incidence of yeah, storm surges in, in country X, that that's going to translate into an impact um, elsewhere? Um, I'll move just very quickly away from climate just to think about something like biodiversity. I, I, you may have seen that you've had the task force for nature-based financial disclosure, TNFD. We've had a lot of conversation, I think it was COP was it 13, I can't remember where we are in the biodiversity COP. There's a lot of conversation about how companies should be reporting on, on the impacts of um, biodiversity loss, ecosystem services. And central banks, coming back to the earlier question in central banks, they're not just focused on climate, they're focused on climate and environmental. And we're still struggling to crack climate. I mean, I think we have a broader understanding of how it is you conceptualize it. But when it comes to, to broader environmental impacts, that's very, very nascent and, and challenging because I can understand that water availability for a Chilean mining company in the Atacama Desert is an important variable. That doesn't mean water availability for every single mining company on the planet is important. So how you factor all of these variables into account, I think, is is, is quite challenging. So. Look, if you want to email me offline, happy to talk more about this because you could take, you know, study and research in many different directions on this topic. Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'll definitely pick you up. I'll try and uh, connect with you on LinkedIn. Thank you. Sure, no worries. Happy to. <laughs> if nobody else has any questions. Oh, yeah. Hi, it's Millie again. Um, I have a question about natural capital accounting and yeah. um, where you see accounting 
P Morgan changing to account for uh, resource degradation and to account for um, uh, like carbon markets and um, securities markets changing in terms of if the resource is being degraded, then that security is no longer that security or future is no longer worth what it was when you bought it yeah. five years ago, for example. So I, yeah. I'm, I'm asking kind of in that context. Yeah, Millie, you're not going to like my answer. Um, I I have always struggled with how. I mean, I, I get it. Believe me, I I you know, I've been in the space for a reason, which is you know I totally committed to to making sure that we solve a lot of these problems, and, and natural capital is absolutely key to it. I think what I struggle with is understanding how the private sector. I get the impact the private sector has, but when it comes to truly managing the resource and managing spatial impact, unfortunately, it comes back to governments. I, I, I remember having these conversations with Flora and Fauna International, who actually were doing some really groundbreaking work about a decade ago, where they they agreed with me. They, they, they reckon the best way to crack this is you go into certain countries, and Namibia was one of them, I think it was, or Tanzania, where they said, look, you can get all the companies or all the industries that are active in these countries to report what their biodiversity policy is, what their ecosystem impact is, water usage, etc. That that's all fine, but it's not going to give you much. You can't really piece that together appropriately. What you actually need is more strategic planning at the governmental level, because the government that should have visibility over, you know, what what economic activity have I just incentivized in this area? What what in aggregate? What are the um, the ecosystem impacts, the deforestation impacts, water impacts, etc. You know, count them all. Um, and and how do I make sure that in the reporting that these companies are giving to me, according to whatever um, licenses or permits I've given them, I can I can form an accurate, accurate and aggregated view on what the true impact is um, within that area. And and it should be governments, which I know is what they started at Kunming, I think it was a decade ago. It's governments that should hold the, the balance sheet of all of these all natural capital balance sheets and have a view of exactly what these impacts are. Now, coming back to try and answer your question in a slightly different way, just very quickly, is I, I do think there's merit in us understanding the impact we have through, for instance, our financing or our clients understanding where it is they're operating. And they, you, know, you could have a company that's active in 200 countries and they've got you know, a thousand different assets. Each of those is going to have its own impact and profile. Is there merit and value in aggregating all of that into into some form of reporting? Possibly, but I think it's still going to be disparate. I don't think it's going to give you as fulsome a picture as, as you would think in terms of the actual natural capital impact. So so I think this is something that still needs to be fleshed out a lot more. And, and I've seen some of the conversations within the TNFD con context. I think first and foremost, it has to start with country level balance sheets, if you will, around what is the, the what is the asset in essence so the natural capital asset and how is it it's being allocated or appropriately managed and and it's up to governments to make sure that in all the reporting we provide there's 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 better visibility over that so as i said you probably don't like that answer i think more work needs to be done in this space and um, yeah can i can i jump back on on that yeah of course and um, so yeah i kind of have some problems with what you're saying to be brutally honest because mm -hmm. um if governments can't agree on how to manage and allocate these resources, for example, the collapse of the recent um, COP in Glasgow, um, the government's basically said the private sector needs to do more. And what I'm hearing from you is that mm. the private sector can't do more and governments need to do more. So you're both at loggerheads. Yep. So if you're both at loggerheads and you're bouncing the problem back to governments and making money in the meantime, doesn't that just make you as culpable? Uh, you look, we could have that debate. Um, I don't think so, because, I mean, it's all of us that put these governments in power, and it's their, it's their decisions that you know, allocate resources. Um, it's companies that, that will benefit from those allocations. You know, yes, we can monitor and report on what impact we're having and whatever our activities are. I'm fine with that, and that's what we do already. I think the broader question is if if what we need to start demonstrating is when we're looking at a company that we demonstrate the financial impact of their mismanagement of water resources in Brazil, it's pretty challenging to do. 
the you know the research hasn't been hasn't been appropriately done you know and, and you need a more aggregated view because you need to understand again the ecosystem in a different context you need to understand the ecosystem impacts of an aggregated view and often when we look at projects just to give you one example when we look at any project um, we're always asking questions about it's fine for us to understand the environmental social impacts of you know whatever this activity is a mine or power plant but we often and certainly when it comes to hydropower we need to understand the ecosystem impacts, the strategic environmental assessment that needs to be done in certain areas, which can only be sanctioned by a government. They're the ones that actually plan for, for, these, um, for these developments. And oftentimes in countries, you don't have that. And so you've got the World Bank and others who are trying to piece this together to make sure it's done. So there's a lot of work that still needs to happen. Um, and as I said, I, I accept you don't like my answer, but unfortunately, you know, un unless and until governments take more seriously the commitments they made, I think it was Kunming a decade ago around these balance sheets, it's difficult f to see that reporting and markets are going to solve the problem. I think there's a lot more that needs to happen. Yeah, thank, thank you for thank you for your um, answer. And uh, sorry if I came across as... Uh, not, not at all. Uh, I was just trying to press you on some of the issues that I think need to be addressed but i'd be really yep. happy to continue this conversation if if you don't mind of course not happy to thank you <laughs> Cool. I think we're going to wrap it up there. Um, but thank you very much for your time and for no fielding all those questions. Um, it's been really great to have you and hopefully look forward to future relations. Yep. Anytime. And as I said, anyone can reach out to me. You'll find me on LinkedIn. So just drop me a note. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay.